And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Vindicated Entertainment, and and the madman behind other worlds which we've been covering on Valley of the Judged. And now and now coming up coming up with Black Paper Moon, which we'll be getting into tonight, the one and only Vincent Baker. Not a candlestick maker. Sorry, had to. Indeed, I am not a candlestick maker. Thank you, Brother Mildra, for inviting me back into the temple once more. I'm happy to be here, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm ready to talk about Black Paper Moon, and just to have a wonderful conversation with you. Uh, for those listening, uh, we've been talking uh, <laughs> for a while before we even started this interview, so uh, we're, we're already geared up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So, of course, last time I asked about, about humble beginnings, and to be fair, I... I had I had to juggle like two or three different things to fo to focus on in that interview, but for this one, obviously, I'm a, I am able to have a little bit more focus. So, let's start with the origin story of Black Paper Moon when it came, when it comes to actually doing it, because um, I remember I know that you mentioned that there were a few projects you had you had in the works when I had you on for an interview beforehand, but. Um, I don't remember this. Be I don't know. This wasn't one of them. I know that for a fact. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe I, I mentioned this one at all. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the name kind of gives it away. Your your lo your love for Soul Eater, but was was it just wanting to do a tabletop Soul Eater that sparked it, or was there a different path? Yeah. So for those that are listening, Soul Eater is a is a fun anime done by Studio Bones, and you should check it out if you haven't watched it yet. Um. The so there's a lot of things that come to mind when when you ask this question. So uh, first of all, uh, I have noticed I have tons of games uh, sort of like on the back burner. So at any given moment when I talk about future projects and stuff, um, I sort of have like ten different projects sort of on the shelf, so to speak. And then um, depending on uh, if I hit a snag with one, uh, whether it be in, in gameplay design, maybe I'm not like seeing it. Like maybe it's not quite at the level of fun it needs to be. Uh, maybe there's an issue with uh, having the art direction that I want, or maybe some people I went into it with as like a partnership and they flaked off or something. Like there's so many different reasons why um, there might be one project and then that one uh, sort of has the limelight for a little bit, or I mention it and then it just sort of goes away and then you see something else come out. Um, as for the origins of Black Paper Moon. Uh, technically, uh, I think it was back in 2016, I was trying to create an incentive to get people to sign up for my mailing list, uh, where I basically send infrequent yet awesome um, updates about what's going on in the whole world of Vindicated. And uh, one of the incentives I created was something called a bittersweet trick-or-treat, or abstit for short. And essentially, uh, this was a very small PDF uh, in which it basically uh, laid out the groundwork for what became Black Paper Moon later. Um, whenever I sent this out, though, uh, only a few people even really knew about it because, you know, it was kind of tucked away on, a w on my website. Uh, it wasn't at the very front. <laughs> and you would have to sign up for the newsletter, which I don't even think had a picture of it to even talk about. It, it just said it in writing. And then if someone subscribed to the newsletter, it would be mentioned in, in like a little sentence again. And then if they went onto the website that I'd take them to, they could then download this PDF. But in general, this wasn't listed on like RPG Geek. Uh, it wasn't heavily promoted. I never had a Kickstarter for it. So it just largely went under the radar for most people. Didn't really hear much about it or anything. But what it allowed me to do is I have been playing it ever since I released it in 2016. Um, and it was especially a game that me and my friends would go to around October. Um, as, you know, it has that sort of Halloween-inspired theme. Um, so that's where it actually started and, and came from now as for my plans this year i actually had some other plans um for various reasons uh they sort of needed to take a back seat at the moment mm -hmm. and i had nothing else really going on and ever since i started kickstarter or at least for the last few years i sort of had like this personal oath that i would not do a kickstarter between the months of october through december because it is crazy where i'm working i, I manage a retail job uh, also, it's time for me to uh, spend with family, 
and I just knew it's 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 hectic, it's a mess, it's the hardest time for for me to do a Kickstarter essentially. And I mean, December just seems like an awful month for Kickstarter, anyways, because everyone's wanting to spend their money on gifts and and presents and whatnot. Um, so I I wasn't planning on doing this at all um, until uh, September rolled around. I got an email from Kickstarter, and they said that they're doing this special promotion called Witch Starter, which is if you do a project in October that has a sort of spooky theme, uh, they can tag it with the tag Witch Starter, and they'll help promote it within their algorithm. Now, I'm not actually sure if this has any effect because I haven't really seen this actually be that beneficial to me in any way, but this actually like kicked it in my mind. It's like, okay, well, if I did a project, and also keep in mind, earlier this year, it took, way, it, it took me longer uh, than I expected to finish the other world's core rule book and, and get that to backers. Now, luckily, uh, I, I managed to get it to backers on time, but the time that I listed was months past what I thought it would take. I just gave myself enough a bumper, or I just gave myself enough room to where if I would be late uh, to everyone else, it appeared like I was on time. Uh, so, so, uh, but it was past my personal time that I wanted to do. But luckily, I still delivered on time as far as what I told backers it would be. Um, so I delivered that on time, but, uh, I wasn't able to basically do other projects like I wanted to throughout the year. Uh, so, it's, so, so, sorry, excuse me. Um, it's so, it sort of set me back more than I wanted it to. Um, but then here comes this witch starter thing. I had Abstot, which was already sort of made. It was, it laid out the groundwork. Uh, so I was like, okay, let me bring this back. I'm going to spend the next two months preparing it for Kickstarter in October. Um, so I went ahead and I, I got new artwork for it. I went ahead and expanded the contents by like tenfold. Um, now granted, it's still very rules light, but the, the previous one didn't really have enough there. I've, I've learned over the years sort of like what is, what is needed and what's more important to have. And, and so I expanded on a lot of things that needed ex expansion. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it, I just sort of kicked it into overdrive and, and just sort of put this out there because, um, I also, since I have so many games like sort of on the back burner, um, I really want to to have them made. You know, it feels very satisfying to actually see them as a finished project, um, and it, it can be kind of you know annoying to just have them. It's like, yeah, I made this six years ago, but it's not. It's just not quite there. You know, I I, I got very far in, in finishing it, but it's not quite finished. So I, I try to be a finisher and just you know complete these projects. So. Uh, here we are with Black Paper Moon, which the name actually wasn't Black Paper Moon until uh, very close to the Kickstarter. I cannot remember exactly when I changed it, uh, but it, it it was going to go into this, uh, still called a bittersweet trick or treat. And uh, essentially, I I wasn't completely happy with the name because uh, while I liked the name, it was rather long and it seemed like it was very uh, held to Halloween, and I wanted it to be able to feel a little less restricted to just Halloween, uh, especially if you wanted to, you know, like, for example, anyone that is familiar with what I do with Vindicated, we so, uh, we celebrate Summerween every year. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, it'd be fun to have, you know, like a Summerween adventure. And Black Paper Moon feels like you could still have that during Summerween, but not necessarily a bittersweet trick-or-treat. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of going with that. I tested uh, the names with a bunch of different people. Uh, some people have watched Solater. Some people never watched Solater, never heard of it. Um, some people uh, played the game with me, and I gave them uh, a list of different names. And uh, regardless of their familiarity with the term, they like Black Paper Moon the most. Um, we actually heard interesting feedback. Like we've heard people say that it reminded them of, uh, like the game itself reminded them of Earthbound, which is a game I've never played. But uh, we've heard that a couple of times, and like, well, that's interesting. I've never played Earthbound, but you know, we've we've had that response before. Um, but yeah, that's where we are. Um, I like the name a lot just because I, I it's not just the Soul Eater thing. Uh, I didn't go into it as like a Soul Eater inspired uh, tabletop RPG, but. Um, just Soul Eater fits naturally up my alley for like the the fun, the 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 colorful, the playfulness, the spookiness, um, and just a lot that it has going for it. It just kind of already fit with like who I am, so it just feels natural for that for, for that to kind of fit together. Mm -hmm. And with that, the one thing that I did notice is that it, it you are still using D six as, as a base. Um, I, I get the feeling that this is 
this is meant to be rules light, so it's not going to be as granular as other as other worlds was. But when it comes, but let's talk about character creation for a moment, because what I'm curious about is if you ha is if you have some sort of set of archetypes that you're that you're building around, or if or if this is going to be a straight expenditure of points, a la a lot of um, universalist games from the 2000s. Yeah, so one thing I like to do when I make a tabletop RPG is I like it to sort of fill a different space. You know, I don't I don't really want my games to compete with each other if I if I can help it. Um, now maybe down the road that will happen just by virtue of having so many games, but I, I try to really have something like a unique reason for why these games exist. And so when it comes to the character creation for Black Paper Moon, it's very different than other worlds. In other worlds, it's very much like um, you have lists of these different abilities, and you mix and match. You sort of create your own class through combining uh, skill branches to form your own skill tree. It's very sort of... Um, it it, it kind of has some of my love of like Final Fantasy Tactics in that regard, where I love sort of like the mix and match sort of strategy behind like how you want to build it, and you can like really go in-depth about how you want to sort of set up your character for a very like precise, uh, you know, however you want to put them together in that way. Um, it's, it's kind of like tactical in that way, um, which, you know, uh, Other Worlds sort of embodies that. But with Black Paper Moon, it's meant to be a lot more like, hey, you can go to a party or be with your group of friends, or your family. Maybe the, the power goes out. You want to light the candles around the table on a dark, stormy night. And you just want to, like, create some characters and just start playing. Um, so the idea behind it first and foremost came from that sort of very like uh, pick up and play, um, just start role playing, improv, uh, create your characters very fast, uh, that sort of idea. And then after that, I sort of added some more elements to saying like, okay, well, if you want to have a campaign, you can level up. This is how you can expand on your powers and like what your character is. And here's the the greater story at hand if you want to do that. But to uh. To more specifically answer your question, uh, the characters are very simple. You want to have a name. Uh, you want to create like your weapon that your character is proficient with. Uh, it can be your fist or like your your claws and your teeth. It doesn't have to be a literal weapon, you know. So if you're a monk and you are good at hand to hand combat, that could be your quote unquote weapon. Um, your power set. Uh, so it can be literally any type of power set you want. So some of the uh, characters that are already pre-established in the game to give reference is, you know, like a ghost, you know, so your power set is a ghost, so you can think like Danny Phantom, uh, where you, it's like, okay, if, if a ghost can do it, you can do it, and so it's sort of, uh, you can like phase through stuff, and that can go into, you know, you making your skill check, your skill checks for uh, stealth and stuff like that. Um, then there's drawbacks, which is directly tied to your powers. Um, I love the idea of, you know, having to consider what your drawbacks would be. I think uh, something like My Hero Academia does a really good job at this, where you can have the strongest character in the whole show, uh, but he's uh, mortally injured, so he can only withhold that for a certain amount of time before he becomes the weakest character and the most vulnerable. Uh, you know, something like that. So there's built-in drawbacks that you associate with your powers. Um, and then there's a deviation, which is sort of... Um, it's mostly personality traits, uh, and it's something that can sort of cause trouble uh, for you, like where you can be very... Um, heated and irrational when in combat so you run head first and you don't really think things through so you don't really give the other person a chance to talk mm -hmm. and uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing but it certainly could be um and then you have like a mystery which is kind of more if you want to do uh more of a campaign setting for it and let um but essentially the mystery is like what compels your character what mystery are they trying to solve uh, about their character i feel like it's very evocative with sort of that spooky take that the game's going for but essentially, you'll go with those things, and uh, that's how your character's made. It's very freeform in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, taking th taking that into account, the other question I have is is on the matter of making th making things not too freeform, not going not going into the full level of wushu open. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is which is why I phrase things at, as archetypes instead of classes. By the way, don't think it. Don't think I didn't let that um let that little bit of pandering bringing up a monk example slip by me. <laughs> hey, honestly, it was just the it was the easiest to come up with because when I think of like like okay, if you're not gonna fight with your weapons, you probably fight with your fists. Mm -hmm. 
And then I think of a monk. Again, it's Final Fantasy Tactics reference. You have the monks, they punch with the fist. But yes, it's also a, a little uh, nod to, uh, you know, you, Mildred. It works out. Yeah. Now, with with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to creating when it comes to creating power sets and the like, I'm guessing that you have a handful of examples that are going to be in the book. There are a handful of examples, and they because um, I was actually asked this in a previous interview. They were like, "Well, you know, what if someone claims that they want to be a witch, and then with a witch, they can basically say they do whatever. They can predict the future. They can cast fire. They can teleport. You know, like there's a lot you can sort of say that a witch can do." And then in the book, it, it does actually go into describing, like, okay, even if you choose a witch, for example, as your power set, um, there are certain limitations that you pick as sort of, like, your focuses uh, when it comes to being a witch. And then those things can be expanded on later where they can become more powerful, or you can uh, gain new subsets of whatever that witch ability would be. So, for example, if you have a witch that is capable of flying on her broom, and she can also blast arcane projectiles, and she can also do some scrying, um, maybe as you level up, you know, you're, you're stuck to those things, but as you level up, you uh, say if someone tried to burn you in a fire because they found out you're a witch, you can, uh, and say that you miraculously survive, and it's this cool epic moment for the story, you can use that moment to say, like, okay, here's your level up. You can maybe, since you miraculously survived that fire that's supposed to kill you, you now, as a witch, have the ability to cast fire. You know, it's like part of your story now. Or, if you didn't want fire to be part of your identity, you didn't like that idea, you can just say, like, okay, well, what's the next level of being able to fly? Maybe you can start making other objects fly, or maybe you can start having a deeper level of scrying that is more beneficial, or maybe you can start seeing, um, maybe it kind of helps you in combat where you can kind of do it with your eyes and like you can sort of see movements before they happen. So it, it helps you fight in combat, you know. So there's a lot of different avenues you can take it, but it's up to the player on how they want to do that. Yeah. And since you mentioned, you've been mentioning levels a lot, are, are you using a, a typical leveling system or are you going with the XP as currency approach? Um, I've currently n not used XP as currency as any of the standard uh, methods for for leveling up. So in Black Paper Moon, uh, there's not there's there's not even m mentioning of XP. It's more of a uh, it's more of like defining character moments, and it's kind of more the freeform aspect for leveling up. Mm -hmm. So and what. When I meant when I mention XP as currency, what I'm referring to is spending XP to develop skills, ab abilities, what have you. Okay, yeah, sure. I mean, like with that, I mean, when you level up, you can. I mean, that is when you you'll sort of like gain, you know, a new power, expand on your powers and stuff like that. But what determines your level up is is very narrative driven uh, and not based off of like acquiring XP to then make sure you hit a certain criteria to then level up. So a milestone system. Yeah. All right, I can, I can work with that. Now, given given that given that and given the broad sense, do you have it? Do you have any plans on implementing some sort of stunt system? Um, it's a great question. Uh, so this game is meant to be as streamlined and as focused as as possible for like what I'm doing with it. Um, and there's not. There's not a dedicated stunt system to it, but there is a there is a critical uh, system where you can't dice do explode like they do in other worlds. So there is uh, room for there to be like better things that happen with the more criticals that happen, uh, sort of thing that happens. Uh, well, so yeah, if you want to if you want to say so in that way, then there would be. What I mean by a stunt system, for the record, is some is some sort of some sort of mechanical benefit from descriptive play um oh gotcha big, okay a big example of this would be the the way the stunt die system that was that's used in a lot of world of darkness games but especially exalted where you could get one two or three die depending on how depending on how well you describe how you well you described your act your action within the scene Obviously, based okay. on the GMs. I'm following. I'm I'm thinking stunts from like Fantasy Age. If you've uh, played that at all, I, ha uh, I have. <laughs> I have. I like the stunt system in the in the Age system, but that's not, that wasn't a, that wasn't where it was going because 
If there's a, if because the vibe that I get from Black Paper Moon is not too far off from from games like Feng Shui. And and the emphasis on and the emphasis on dynamism that games like that have. Okay. Well, to answer your question about what you were asking about stunts, um, yes, there is an element to that. Um, it does describe in the book that uh, based off of role playing and based off of what's going on, um, the world master does have a a various things that they can award players. Um, among the most unique things that they can award a player is something called wishes, um, which uh, a player can use their wishes to help them um, do like special feats throughout the game or, or like help them survive circumstances. And the more wishes that they use, the better. Um, but the, the thing is, though, is they're capped out how many wishes they can even have at one time based off their level. So normally if you just do sort of like a one shot and you're sort of picking up and playing the idea is every player would just have one wish. Um, but if you do level up throughout the game and you play a more storied uh, game in that way, there is opportunity to have more wishes at, at one time. But being capped at one does make it so players, you know, will be participating and using it so they can then, you know, get more wishes later. Mm -hmm. So now that that brings me to the what you call the 13th hour engine. Uh, putting aside putting aside the fact that I I hope that you have a clock with th with thirteen hours in the book, otherwise I'm going to be disappointed. Um, <laughs> talk to me about about how that came to be and what exactly you mean by that. Yeah, so um, I like the number thirteen a good bit. I mean, people that follow Vindicated know that we released a card game called Gulatine, and uh, it definitely uses that number. Um, with Black Paper Moon, um, I came up with the name for that engine, uh, mostly out of the idea that the, the core function behind the engine uh, started from what we call the die tower, uh, which is essentially a tower made of dice. Now, some people are like, oh, well, shouldn't that be called a dice tower? But no, it's meant to be a pun, you know, wordplay, die tower. Uh, the reason being is as you start failing challenges, you have to start stacking uh, literal six-sided dice to form a tower. Um, and should the tower fall over, something bad happens, and it moves the story forward. Um, now, if you know if you're wanting to play kind of the one shot that's just kind of all over the place, you know the die tower falling could mean the character dies. Um, but if you don't have to make it that, uh, you know there's options for what you can do with that. But that's sort of the main um, way of going about that. And at that time when I chose the name, uh, the highest, the the most amount of dice I've been able to correctly stack to this tower was 13. So I was like, okay, well, that's kind of a fun coincidence that 13 is the highest I could stack to this before it falls over and, you know, a character dies or something bad happens. Uh, so thus, the 13th hour engine was born. You're going to traumatize Jenga players. You know that, right? <laughs> sure, we'll go for that. <laughs> like if, you've probably played Jenga at least once in your life, so you know the pain. Yeah, and I'm not the best at Jenga either, so... Um... So yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and granted, I, I've tried to replicate this and get 13 dice stuck uh, to make the tower again, and I can't do it. Now Now I get like 8 and 9, and I don't know what's wrong with me. Like I, I, I'm like, man, like this is a... So it could be quite varied. And real quick before I forget, um, we did have it mentioned before that playing online with this dice tower concept uh, doesn't necessarily work, uh, depending on how people want to set up things. Uh, to play online, or maybe someone has a condition that would make stacking dice uh, basically un like uniquely difficult for that player, um, opposed to the other people at the table. There is an alternative variant rule in the game called the dice, uh, the die roll, mm -hmm. uh, and the die roll, like the die tower, um, gets harder and, and more difficult the more uh, is stacked, quote unquote stacked. You basically form a bigger and bigger die pool or dice pool uh, that you'll be rolling and then that can cause bad things to happen based off of what you roll so there is a variant there for people that need it slash want it yeah and with and with that in, with that in mind given given what you wrote in the challenges section on the kickstarter would it be fair of me to say that under most circumstances you're only going to be rolling either 1d6 or 2d6 at any given time I'd say that's fair, yeah. Which that's a good thing because that means you don't have to deal with um 
the Shadowrun problem of somebody bringing in way too many dice. Although, let's be fair, people are going to bring too many dice as it is. <laughs> yeah, but the bigger problem isn't bringing a lot of dice. It's when you roll a lot of dice and you always have players that roll them off the tables and then they just go everywhere. Yeah, and re and remember, if it if it doesn't land on the table, it doesn't count. Yeah, and anytime I bring a dice tray, the people that roll the dice off the table always forget the dice tray is there, and they just roll it off the table anyways. I can't help but wonder if they do that on purpose. I know. As I'm as I'm saying this, I'm like, man, I, am I sure? Am I being naive by thinking that this is just not done on purpose? Because it really feels like it is. Because. Look, I, I've seen people come up with creative ways of of of, tr of trying to bend the rules, um, and I and that's usually when I have to threaten them with if they, if they if they keep doing that, then they're gonna have to do the punishment game. Oh no! What's the punishment game? Um, drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh no! <laughs> okay, that's quite a punishment. Either, either that or drink the pain glass, which is a shot glass filled with, and I've told, I've told this story before on the show, water, salt, sea salt, um, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, um, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, sriracha, and ground up jalapeno seeds. Uh, no thank you. <laughs> well, usually, like, I think, I, I figure the best way to keep people from not cheating is by making the punishment worse than the crime. Yeah. No, I thankfully I haven't had to deal with cheating in quite some time, but I definitely remember a time where I did have to deal with it and it's very frustrating. It's not the first time I've done this kind of thing. I when I when I'd run golden eye tournaments with with myself and my and a bunch of my friends, we had a, we had a rule that if you picked odd job, every, everyone it everyone in the tournament is allowed to punch you in the nuts. <laughs> Did you have anyone that actually chose odd job, like knowing that was the punishment? Yeah, he thought he was slick when he he, he thought he was slick when he was wearing a cup. So I, but um, he forgot that I have a coal miner's glove. <laughs> okay, he, that's funny. He figured I've got a cup. You can hit you can hit me all you like. It's not going to matter. Um, the thing about the the thing about armor is just be, just because it protects you from getting cut doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Like pe it's people fair. have gotten broken ribs from getting shot while wearing Kevlar. It yeah. Did, it didn't pen. It didn't penetrate, but you're but you're still getting hit with, with some with something going going se going um several miles a second. Yeah, it's fair. It kept you alive, but it does not mean it didn't kick your ass. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd u I'd use that explanation when, it, when explaining why people would have a hard time fighting uh, fighting against um Vader if his attacks are always so slow. Okay. Makes sense. I mean, yeah, they're slow, but you're still blocking them, and your arms and legs are going to get tired. His aren't. I think a lot of people don't realize how terrifying it is to have to go up against some against somebody whose arms and legs do not tire. That makes sense. <laughs> but... Get, but getting getting back to getting back to the ma to the matter at hand, since you mentioned the idea of of somebody potentially doing spells, um, I'm curious if if BPM is going to have any sort of um, limited re limited resource or some sort of extra effort resource. So there isn't directly one uh, tied into the game like there is other worlds. However, uh, there is the drawback system that I mentioned to you. So. Um, each character's uh, magic that they may have uh, could actually have uh, very different forms of drawback. So instead of having like a like a magic point system, uh, like there is in other worlds, um, it could be that for a player at the table. But there could also be another player at the table that has a completely different system that they're using for their set of magic. Yeah. And is, this isn't just this this kind of that kind of limitation. I, I don't want to limit that to just magic. Um, it could just as well be that somebody has some very um, powerful ability, but they can only use it a handful of times. Um, yeah. So every character is is supposed to have a drawback. Like it's on the character sheet. It's something that's 
specifically stated and listed. So regardless if they have magic or if it has nothing to do with magic, whether maybe their power is just some some sort of crazy uh, martial feat where they can do tons of uh, dragon kicks or something. Maybe maybe they're uh, Luke Kang from Mortal Kombat and they do bicycle kicks. Um, they should still have a drawback associated to their character. Well, just a couple examples I can think of of, of something that isn't magic but would still fit, would still fit in that whole limitation thing. Um, did you ever see Scryed when that when that was airing? Scryed? Yes, yeah, S. Scryed. I've never heard of it. Um, that is a that was a interesting beast from the early two thousands, but um. One of the one of the protagonists, um, Kazuma, had had essentially essentially a a kind of finisher ability that he only had three charges of whenever whenever the fight would go down. And of course, beyond that, you have a lot of the early days of Yu Yu Hakusho, where Yusuke had the spirit gun, but it had a but it had a set number of times he could use it. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of that sort of thing. Um, I I feel like it forces people to be more invested in their character, what's going on, pay attention to things, and to make interesting choices. And if you have an unlimited amount of anything, um, it just takes away a lot of that. I feel like a lot of the most interesting moments comes from some scarcity. So um, I actually like that uh, myself. So that so that is tied into the game. Of course, it's also important to not to not swing the pendulum too far the other way because then you end up dealing with the rainy day paradox. I I must admit I've not heard of it, but I'm sure once you explain it, I will fully understand. It's also called the ninety nine mega elixirs. Basically, we're basically where somebody's holding on to a limited resource until because they think they might need it later, even if they're going up against the b bag of the at the end of a campaign. They'll still be like, what if I need this for later? Gotcha. Yeah, well, I think it does help, too, where a lot of this stuff, you know, will, you know, reset when they're healed if they're using their health as a resource, or maybe it's dealing with exhaustion so they can rest or whatever it may be. A lot of this stuff, um, like, when it comes to what you're saying, uh, I think of, like, the Master Ball from Pokemon. You know, it's something that you only get one of in the game, no matter how long you play, no matter what you do, unless you use some sort of glitch or cheat code, you're stuck to the one Master Ball. So you can have that paradox where you're just kind of like, you just never use it because you're afraid to because you just want to use it on the right target. But when it comes to something like Black Paper Moon, um, these, even though things are limited, uh, they will reset, I feel like, often enough to where, you know, you know you're getting it back. So you're not kind of stuck holding on to it forever and it's from what you're describing it's it's likely that th that this that um you're going to be leaning more into theater of the mind than and than a more traditional approach yeah so um so like whether other worlds can do either um it's, it's designed to do either i found a lot of people like to do more of the normally with the miniatures and more of the tactical approach but it's it's fully capable of doing theater of the mind um black paper moon is definitely designed more suited for theater of the mind uh you could use miniatures as a reference and stuff but when it comes to sort of like the the range uh and sort of like the uh the distances and stuff it's more of a abstract based thing than counting squares and and, and stuff like that mm -hmm. now with that in now with that in mind um what are you shooting for as far as as far as a total page count yeah so uh that's a great question so currently it's actually set in a tarot card sized book which i, f I feel like uh, is interesting and and may throw some people off cuz it's like that's a it's kind of a small book um but it's all kind of set in this manga-styled box that we have going on. It's sort of a new design that we're doing uh, for for our games, um, and I haven't seen anyone else do it. Uh, so you know, we'll we'll see if that pops up. But anyways, um, g given that it's you know the smaller size, but it is very much a rules light RPG. It's looking like it will be give or take forty pages, uh, maybe maybe more. But that's maybe a little more. But that's kind of like where we're at with it. And now, when it comes when it comes 
when it comes to when it comes when it comes to mo when it comes to monster entries, um, obviously obviously there's going to be a handful. But do you plan on putting in a side covering um, how custom monsters could be made with with the system? Not a not a full on set of rules, but a se a series of suggestions. Um, I believe so. Uh, I will say it does seem pretty straightforward. Uh, there's currently, I believe, 17 monsters, including uh, the monsters in the sample adventure provided. So in the book currently, there is a sample adventure that you can run uh, that has some monsters. Uh, and then there is monsters outside of that. So I believe it's 17 when you add all those together. And they vary from difficulty. You have very easy monsters all the way up to the highest level monsters. Um with that being said, though, it does cover all aspects. You know, we have very strong, very weak, we have fast, we have uh, magical, we have undead, we have all sorts of things in there. Um, so I, I I do want to make sure that that players have the tools, though, to do that if they need to. Um, so it is something I do care about, because I, I have added that into my other games to make sure that people uh, can, can have that resource, uh, you know, because I do know that's important for a lot of people, um, understandably. Uh, I think with Black Paper Moon, it's very, very straightforward. Um, so, you know, it'll it'll be there if it's needed. Uh, I, I do plan on getting some feedback on that. But uh, currently, it's just pretty straightforward, and we do have a, a nice-sized monster section there. Mm -hmm. Well, I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it turns out, as well as what what um what equally crazy and dumb ideas come out of it. Yeah, there's a uh, flying bazooka monkeys as one of the monsters. And uh, and um, with that with that in mind, I'd like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple once again and enjoy the particular brand of insanity that happens here. Hey, you're very welcome. It's always an honor to be here. And of and of course. A sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!